Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our cardiology grand rounds. Today for grand rounds, uh, we have a, a very special speaker. Actually, I'd like to say that actually we have two visiting professors that are probably the preeminent cardiology educators and uh, a most powerful couple in cardiovascular disease, Dr. Rick Nishimura and uh, Dr. Carl Warnes. Uh, Dr. Nishimura gave yesterday a, uh, an amazing conference on how to educate the future generation of cardiologists for the fellows and beyond. And I would uh, urge you to take a look at that. It is recorded and I will be posted shortly. And today we have a treat with Dr. Warrens, uh, who will address heart disease and pregnancy. Dr. Warrens does not need any introduction. She is professor of medicine and cardiology at Mayo Clinic. Did her early training in England and in England at Newcastle uh, early on upon Tyre University. Then British Heart Foundation was a research fellow there under Dr. Somerville, who is. Uh, one of the leaders, really, and uh, forefathers, or four women fathers, uh, for uh, congenital heart disease, uh, came to Mayo Clinic in 88 and rose through the ranks uh, to professorship of uh, cardiology. And her impact has been amazing in multiple areas. One, she is the director of the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program at Mayo, and probably the largest adult congenital heart disease in the country. Uh, for training as well as practice, and certainly has made her mark not only in that field, but also in the field of pregnancy and heart disease, and I know she will share that with us. She's quite involved at the American College of Cardiology and Education. She was on the board, uh, a member of the board of trustees of the American College of Cardiology, chair of the Council of Women in Cardiology. Uh, we talked about that yesterday, that we really need more, than, uh, more women involved in cardiology at multiple levels. Uh, we're only at about 10% of the workforce in women, and I think we need to do uh, something positively with that, and I know she's a, a major force to try to change this. Um, she uh, has been voted so many years as the outstanding teacher at Mayo Clinic, but not only at the Mayo Clinic. She has received the Lenec Master Clinician Award from the American Heart Association, the Distinguished Fellow Award from the American College of Cardiology, certainly is uh, one of the major teachers and, and pushing education. She actually uh, has been on the lifelong learning uh, committee of, uh, of the American College of Cardiology and we've had the opportunity to work to there together for many years and I, I've had the opportunity also to work with Rick also for so many years. So it's really a treat to have both of them come and spend a day and a half with us uh, with our trainees, with our faculty, and I really appreciate having you both here with us uh, to share your experience and your energy, vision, and focus uh, in the field of cardiovascular medicine. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Morris to tell us about pregnancy and heart disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a, a real treat to visit you all and uh, to see a number of old friends and hopefully to make some new ones. And uh, I'm going to uh, share with you now some thoughts about uh, heart disease and pregnancy. Um, a friend of mine who's a colleague in Italy, and as you know, Italians know everything about love, or at least they talk about it a good deal. And she gave me this slide, if you have heart disease, don't fall in love. If you fall in love, don't make love. If you make love, don't get pregnant. And if you get pregnant, don't have a child. And so we're going to explore whether those things are really true for the woman who has heart disease. And I'm going to try and share with you the contraindications for pregnancy. Um, for women with heart disease and to talk about some appropriate strategies for a variety of heart defects. There are a lot of problems when we think about the woman with heart disease for all of the practitioners because symptoms and signs of a normal pregnancy, as you all know, can suggest the presence of cardiac disease. They're short of breath, they get swelling, but pregnancy can exacerbate pre-existing cardiac disease and sometimes unfortunately cardiac disease can manifest for the very first time 
during pregnancy. So there are a number of problems and last but not least the maternal cardiac disease of course increases fetal risk. So there's a number of considerations and many practitioners I think around the country make mistakes. They fail to recognize that the woman has heart disease at all. Sometimes they know the woman has cardiac disease but they really don't do an adequate pre-pregnancy evaluation. And <clears throat> for some of us, cardiac disease is very complex and I'll share some of those with you when there really isn't an ideal management strategy and last speaking just for me, women never do what they're told anyway. That's my <laughs> So we have some challenges, so let's explore some of those. Um, it's probably more common than you might think. 2% of pregnancies involve maternal cardiac disease and when you think about congenital heart disease, which is how I got into it, the last 50 years of triumph of success of imaging and surgery, we have this, quotes new population of adult congenital heart disease patients. It's not so new, but there are about one and a half million estimated population in North America. And those women who have survived or maybe never even knew they had congenital heart disease want to be normal like the rest of us. They want to have babies, they want to have families. And so many of the patients that we see have congenital heart disease. And the good news is, is that if the woman has heart disease, it doesn't preclude a pregnancy. Very often, most women can have a successful pregnancy, but often there's an increased risk to mother and baby. And of course, the key is to do pre-pregnancy counseling if you have that opportunity. And that's really the time when we need to provide to these women a prognosis um, as much as we can tell, a truthful account of what the potential hazards are of having a baby. And quite often, unfortunately, those risks are either minimized or exaggerated. And our own, our own thoughts about the issue are not really relevant. We just have to be truthful and give them the perspective of how we think the future will be and whether the risk will change with time or treatment. Maybe now's the time, in 10 years, it might be a little bit more risky. So that counseling is really key. And that gives us the opportunity to risk stratify. And I'll share with you the risk stratification protocols we should be using nowadays. But that also allows you to start planning your antepartum care. So you'll then be able to say to the woman, I want to be the third phone call after your partner, your mother, and then call me. Or maybe it's an easier situation and you can say you can call me in three months and we'll talk about it. So you organize that plan of care at the time of pre-pregnancy counseling and what the follow-up plan might be introduce them to your OB team and then talk about where they should be delivered. Should it be locally? Should it be with you in-house? All of those things can be planned. And for the women who are unable to have a pregnancy, um, talk about what the alternatives are, adoption and surrogacy, and last but not least, contraception, because if you're counseling them, don't do it. You need to tell them how to avoid a pregnancy safely. So that's really the key, is to get that counseling done first. It also gives you the chance to talk about what drugs the patient's on. We'll talk about anticoagulation a little bit. And to look at the medications and talk about risks and benefits and to give them prophylaxis, uh, to give them their folic acid. And this is just a brief list of some of the drugs that we can use during pregnancy that are relatively safe. Many um, local providers think, oh, beta blockers are terrible, they need to be stopped. That's one of the most common ones that providers will stop. And actually, they are safe during pregnancy. I've used them for over 30 years, and they are not a problem. a 10 has got a bad rap, but um, beta blockers are safe and often should be continued for the safety of the mother. But there are a whole variety of drugs, and you'll see there high in the list are the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs that are contraindicated during pregnancy, and a variety of other drugs that are not safe. So we need to know about all of these things again, and to discontinue these drugs at the time we see the patient for counseling. So let's start thinking about the cardiac patient and what are the issues we need to review. So as you think about the changes during pregnancy, one of the key ones is 
the volume load that that patient's heart has to withstand. It's a, about a 50% volume load. You can see here that the volume load of pregnancy starts to go up even in the first trimester. The plasma volume actually peaks about 50% above baseline. So whatever cardiac lesion you're dealing with, that heart has to withstand 50% more volume. And there's a lesser rise in red cell mass, which leads to the anemia of pregnancy. But the other things that happen, there's a fall in peripheral resistance. So the cardiac output, the blood volume goes up, but there's a fall in peripheral resistance as the uterine blood flow goes up. So the heart rate goes up, output goes up, the blood pressure tends to stay the same or fall, and the venous pressure in the legs goes up, which is why about 80% of perfectly healthy women get pedal edema. But if you think about these changes, you can understand what lesions aren't so well tolerated in pregnancy. So for example, if you have a lesion like aortic stenosis, not only do you have the volume, you have the fall in afterload, that's gonna get worse. The gradient across an aortic valve will then get worse. So in general, the hemodynamic changes predict that regurgitant lesions in general are much better tolerated because of the afterload reduction than our stenotic lesions. So that's just a general principle. So let's look at risk stratification. And this is the model that we use now that's been most validated. This is the World Health Organization classification. And we like all our patients to be in group one with no increase in mortality or morbidity. But as you see, two, three, and four get a little bit higher. And when we get down to class four, these are the patients that are a major problem for the cardiac practitioner because these are the ones that have a very high mortality and morbidity. Pregnancy is contraindicated and unfortunately sometimes you might even need to discuss termination, which is a very difficult situation. And so I'm going to focus my attention on those ones that are high risk. And interestingly, mechanical valves only falls into category three. And by the end of this talk, I'll let you decide whether you think they should be class three or class four. But these are the ones we worry about. Pulmonary hypertension, ventricular dysfunction, I'll touch on these. We talked about stenotic lesions, valvular heart disease. And then we've got the vulnerable aorta, those patients remember, who have an aortopathy. If you have a bicuspid valve, that aorta is inherently fragile. And if the aorta is bigger than 50 with a bicuspid valve, pregnancy is contraindicated. More risky, so the cutoff is lower with Marfan. It's 45 millimeters. And there are things like coarctation that go along with that also. So I'm going to focus. I can't do all of these, but I'm going to focus on some of these that really concern us. Um, one of the major ones is Isominger syndrome and idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And um, in the early years, we were quoted something like a 50% mater maternal mortality for patients with Isominger syndrome. Um, and even with all the modern armamentarium of drugs that we can give to these patients, unfortunately, maternal risk is still very high. Mortality is about 30%. And yes, we've got sildenafil and things that we can use during pregnancy, anipoprostinol. But unfortunately, these women will still often, early after delivery, most commonly, have a sudden plunge in hemodynamics. They'll have a fall in afterload, and it is irreversible. They'll go bluer and bluer, or they'll have a sudden collapse with pulmonary thrombosis, in situ pulmonary thrombosis. So even in the modern era, with all our current drugs, pregnancy is contraindicated for those, and peripartum is a major risk, and you may have a healthy baby and then suddenly use your mother. It's catastrophic. So um, these are the ones we really need to counsel against and, and uh, avoid pregnancy. Let's spend a bit of time talking about peripartum cardiomyopathy because there is some new data and particularly patients who've had a prior episode of peripartum cardiomyopathy and residual reduction in LV function. And this is this situation where you get ventricular dysfunction usually um, in the three months before delivery. And then particularly, as you see here, most commonly 
in the month after delivery. This is when it most frequently occurs. So it's this new diagnosis of heart failure, often a diagnosis of exclusion. It's very interesting if you look around the world, I think what a difference there is in variability in peripartum cardiomyopathy. Not so common in the US, but if you go to Haiti and South Africa, much more common. And we'll talk about the reasons for that. Um, risk factors, older age, multifetal pregnancy, multiparity, and the obvious things like hypertension and diabetes and smoking, but unfortunately more common in black women, as I mentioned, particularly in Haiti. And some new data published in the last couple of years, this is a, a registry of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy. And how, how do these women do? As you know, some of them will present with an ejection fraction of sometimes 10% catastrophically. And this, is, this has some important data because it gives us some prognostic markers from this registry. 72% of women recovered, but 13% had major events or persistent reduction in ejection fraction. And again, unfortunately, black women tend to have more LV dysfunction at presentation and persist in having LV dysfunction. But this study gave us some prognostic markers. And here on this um, horizontal axis, you can see what the ejection fraction was at the time of the initial presentation and uh, what it was at the final status six or 12 months after recovery. And you can see here that if your ejection fraction was more than 30% at baseline, you had a much better chance of recovering your ejection fraction, 86% of women recovered, versus only 37% of those recovered if your ejection fraction was less than 35% um, 30 30 at baseline. So the worse your ejection fraction when you present, the much less likely you are to recover your ejection fraction six or 12 months subsequently. And the other thing they looked at was the size of the ventricle. Here, they used to cut off an end diastolic dimension of six centimeters. And you can see there the recovery of the ventricle at six and 12 months. And again, the bigger the ventricle, the much less likely you were to recover. So if you had a combination of both, if you had an EF less than 30 and a ventricle diastolic dimension bigger than 60, no person recovered in this registry. So that really predicts the worst prognosis. None of those recovered at one year. And so now we're starting to get some prognostic markers about patients that need early either VAD therapy or transplantation. Um, we have learned something else about the pathophysiology. I'll talk about this prolactin in a minute. I mean, things have been postulated over the years. It's a virus. There is a guanine nucleotide polymorphism that's a genetic susceptibility, which is much more common in, in black women. It's the same uh, polymorphism that's associated with hypertension, so there may be a sort of relationship there. And people have talked about it's a vascular disease and so on and so forth. But in the last couple of years, there's this uh, implication which is becoming increasingly prevalent and I think is now going to hit the guidelines that it's a problem with prolactin, that hormone that is so prevalent in women, that there's an unbalanced um, oxidative stress that takes place during pregnancy and there's this uh, protease called cathepsin D, which cleaves prolactin. And prolactin, this nursing hormone, is a usually benign hormone. But once it's cleaved into this subform, this is a toxic form of prolactin. It's toxic to endothelial cells, to cardiac myocytes, it's anti-angiogenic, it's inflammatory, and it's pro-apoptotic. So this nursing hormone gets cleaved and is very toxic to the cardiovascular system on the myocytes and the cardiac vasculature. And so what people have been testing is to see whether if you block prolactin with bromocryptine, that maybe you can prevent this development of this toxic form of prolactin and actually prevent or help treat peripartum 
cardiomyopathy. And an initial study, much has been done by this group in South Africa, looking at bromocryptine, and this was a trial study looking at a small group of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy. And you can see there the 10 of them treated with bromocryptine, 10 of them had your standard heart failure therapy, and you'll see the difference in mortality, 40% with standard care, 10% with bromocryptine, and the ejection fraction was better in this first initial study group in the group that was treated with bromocryptine. Most of them got better. So um, they also looked to see, did it prevent subsequent peripartum cardiomyopathy? And they had protection from a relapse of peripartum disease when they had a subsequent pregnancy. So this was very encouraging. 20 patients doesn't make a guideline, but it's a good um, beginning. The challenge with bromocryptine uh, story is that the prolactin tends to act as a scavenger for thrombin and modulate coagulation. So if you eliminate prolactin with bromocryptine, probably you're increasing the risk of clot and stroke. And so everybody with bromocryptine should be anticoagulated, these authors suggested. But there's a more recent study, this is just published uh, just a few months ago, uh, now with a multi-sender randomized study, because we've been arguing about bromocryptine for a few years now, and this was a group of patients, 63 of them, that were treated with just one week of bromocryptine versus eight weeks of bromocryptine with different doses there, as you see, and then to see what happened to them and does it actually work, because it's never made it into the guidelines and you see the patients divided and randomized with similar ejection fractions treated with either a week or eight weeks of therapy. And you can see the results of the ejection fraction at follow-up. They were very good. The deltas actually were fairly similar in the change of ejection fraction. But look at the number of women who had a full recovery, 52% and then 68% with eight weeks of therapy. This is really um, very encouraging and actually no difference between the duration of therapy, but at least it suggests that maybe with these patients who often, as you all know, are catastrophically ill when they come helicoptering in, that probably at least a week of additional treatment with bromocryptine in addition to the standard heart failure therapy is beneficial, even though there's a trend for full recovery in the eight week group. And um, it's certainly better than any prospective study on this disease that's been reported so far. And only 7% of them had an ejection fraction less than 35% at six months follow-up. So, so from those disastrous outcomes that we talked about in the other study, this is really encouraging. And an editorial said, it needs to hit the guidelines. The time is the time is now. So no major adverse events, no deaths, transplants or VADs in this whole group. So encouraging and I think um, it'll be in the guidelines I think soon. It will be in the ESC guidelines that are coming out this year. So um, we're making changes. And the concern that you as practitioners will get asked probably is if you have a patient who has um, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and then the LV recovers, um, can I have another baby? That's the question we often get asked. And, and what's their chance of having another episode if the LV function normalizes? And this was early data, which is still um, one of the um, largest that we've got from LKM. Here in the yellow bars, you can see that uh, these are the patients who did recover their ejection fraction and in the orange, the ones who did not. And you can see the first group here, this is heart failure symptoms. So you'll see a number of patients, even with normal ejection fraction, with the subsequent pregnancy had heart failure symptoms. There were a number who had a more than 20% decrease in ejection fraction the second time around. Persistent decrease in ejection fraction and look at this, maternal mortality. So there was no mortality if the ejection fraction had normalized, but 19% mortality 
if the EF wasn't completely normal with a subsequent pregnancy. So this is a major undertaking such that we say to these patients, probably not advisable to have another pregnancy. If you've got one baby, enjoy that baby, but probably wisest not to have another one. Okay, let's, let's change tack. Let's move to valvular heart disease. I talked about that challenge and maybe we'll have some audience input now and see if you're all caffeinated this morning. Where are the fellows? There's one right there. Um, <laughs> you got picked on yesterday, so I'll pick on somebody else perhaps. So let's take this case. A 30-year-old woman who's 32 weeks pregnant and now she hits your emergency room and she's got dyspnea and palpitations and she's got a heart rate of 95 and the JVP is up and she's got a loud S1 and an opening snap and a diastolic murmur at the apex and you hear crackles and you're giving her the diuretics and her ECG shows she's in sinus tachycardia. And so here's her echocardiogram. You've got the diagnosis from the physical exam, right? Okay. And so there's the mitral valve gradient is 15 millimeters of mercury. So she's in pulmonary edema, tachycardic in your emergency room. So let's ask the fellows, which of these are you going to do? Where's the balloonatics? Are there interventional fellows here? You're going to do a percutaneous intervention on that valve. It looked nice and pliable. You're going to deliver the baby, amiodarone, cardiovert, or beta blocker. Any votes? What would the fellows say? Where's the interventional fellows? Working. Working. The balloonatics. Okay. Number five, beta blocker. Why would you do that? Well, Yeah. Excellent. And you're a balloonatic. Oh, fantastic. Beta blockers. That's great. <laughs> Excellent. That's absolutely right. So here's what we do with beta blockers. We give her beta blockers, slow her down, and the gradient is four. So balloonatics might have gone rushing in, but that would have been too quick because beta blockers are the mainstay of therapy. And you're absolutely right. We need to um, slow the heart rate down because it's the tachycardia that's reducing the diastolic filling time, raising the left atrial pressure. And as the stroke volume goes down, you get faster heart rate and so it all goes. And that's why you get pulmonary edema, particularly if you get atrial fibrillation. So beta blockers, you're right, are the mainstay of therapy. And you really beat a block them until the heart rate goes down to about 50 or 60. And we talked about how you can use metoprolol, really, um, a lot of it. Um, our guidelines don't say anything about anticoagulation in this circumstance. Um, but the ESC guidelines do. AF is evident, but um, left atrial thrombus or embolus. But actually, they've recommended anticoagulation if you have spontaneous contrast in the LA or the LA is large, or you've got a decreased cardiac output or congestive heart failure. So heparin indicated or warfarin in that circumstance. Um, let's move on to another common problem, that of the bicuspid aortic valve and the associated aortopathy that goes with it. The contraindications I mentioned with a bicuspid valve is an aorta larger than 50. For Marfan, the cutoff is a, a lesser size. Turner patients often, um, who now can be made pregnant, um, of course, uh, we usually index by their body size because they're usually so short. And then there are these other more risky um, situations like a Lois Dietz where the aorta is even more fragile. So a pregnancy contraindicated at smaller diameters for them, but let's focus on the common one, the bicuspid valve. In general, if you have aortic stenosis and it's mild to moderate and your patient's symptom free, they'll usually get through a pregnancy well, as long as you've got a compliant patient and they're well, um, they're managed properly. And even with moderate aortic stenosis, if they're asymptomatic, you exercise them and they do a really good exercise test with no angina, good blood pressure response, no ECG changes, 
good ventricle, chances are you'll get them through safely. But of course, the ones with severe aortic stenosis are the problem. And again, the ESC guidelines, again, always recommend exercise testing if there's any doubt, even if your patient says they're asymptomatic. And um, if they have an abnormal exercise test, they need to get the valve dealt with before they embark on a pregnancy because of those changes in the gradient that I mentioned. So for severe AS, they should not get pregnant and you need to intervene beforehand and then hopefully manage them through a successful pregnancy. If you're faced with a patient who's already pregnant, Hugh, I don't know if you've had to be in this situation, you've got a few options, not many. You can sometimes buy a little time because ideally you'd like to get the baby as mature as possible before you have to deliver the baby. And nowadays, um, increasingly, we can help babies survive at younger and younger ages. Sometimes for the balloonetics, you can even do a balloon valvotomy but you want to avoid that if at all possible because that's a risk for mother and baby and usually the whole team has to be assembled in the cath lab if you do that. But so let's take another case. Um, a 47-year-old Amish lady who presented to me in the 22nd week of her 11th pregnancy. At 47. And of course, hadn't seen the doctor for... She hadn't had a baby for about five years. And of course, she lived in the middle of nowhere, working, walking everywhere, except for the last two years. Every time she tried to walk, she got chest pain. And she was, even before she got pregnant, was pre -syncopal. And on exam, she has a loud systolic murmur, and she's short of breath, just walking across your office, climbing onto the bed. Oh, got a bit of chest discomfort. So you can imagine loud systolic murmur on exam. Here's the echocardiogram. Where's the echo readers? What do we think of this valve? Everybody's decaffeinated. Here's a short axis. Obviously, it's hard to look at. We think this is bicuspid. Not easy to tell, but perhaps more importantly, the Doppler. Peak gradient 129. So now what to do? Any thoughts about what to do with this lady who is around 22, 24 weeks pregnant, having chest pain in your office? What would we do? Apart from say a few prayers <laughs> and phone 507-284-6220. What, what would we do? Any thoughts? What about the balloon sticks? No, this is all valve. This is a bicuspid valve, and it looks like it's mobile, but of course, typically, you don't see the top of it and the little hole is right up here. This is real. This valve area is about 0.5. So what, we don't have a lot of choices, right? She isn't going to terminate the pregnancy. It's too late anyway. We either we have to do some intervention. She's not going to get further along in the pregnancy. We can buy a bit of time with maybe some bed rest, and sometimes you can buy a bit of time with a little bit of beta blockade, but we need to do something. My favorite balloonatic sitting in the front row here said, no, thank you. Um, we've done some of these during pregnancy, but this valve is quite thick and quite gnarly. It doesn't have aortic regurgitation, but um, you, know, you want to balloon them just a little bit to be able to get them through the pregnancy. And we thought this was really quite thick. I didn't show you many images. So then you have to do an intervention, and that intervention is cardiac surgery. And we've learned a lot how to make that safer in the last few years with high pump flows and normothermia, not doing hypothermia for the baby, special things with cardiac anesthesia, and having the obstetric team right there. But number one is your fastest, best cardiac surgeon. So we replaced her valve with a bypass time of 31 minutes and normothermia. Baby was fine, we monitored baby, and uh, was an uneventful recovery. Baby, of course, had Downs, we diagnosed that, and baby had an AV canal. But mom and baby did well, until 32 weeks when fetal growth started to go down and it was a breach. So we did an urgent C-section, got baby out. Baby had repair of the AV canal, and both mother and baby 
have done well. And she chose the tissue prosthesis, I think quite appropriately, um, but we had a successful outcome, but potentially a catastrophic situation. And obviously bypass is not something that you like to do during pregnancy, but we've got a whole series that we've published in recent years. And I think we've learned a lot in the last decade. Um, so I'm going to finish with this um, topic, which is one of our most challenging, is that of the woman with a mechanical valve that I mentioned at the beginning fits into WHO class three. So some significant increase in morbidity and mortality, but not contraindicated. And um, as we chose in that last patient, a tissue prosthesis, the question of whether we advise our young women to have a mechanical prosthesis with hopefully no more heart surgery ever versus a tissue prosthesis where you know they're going to have to have another operation perhaps in 10 years time or so. So how do we deal with these situations? So mechanical valves, you will manage your patients, I'm sure, through hip surgeries and prostate surgeries and everything with either bridging or no bridging and you get your patients through safely when they have a mechanical valve. The first thing to tell you is that pregnancy is not like that. It is the time when the blood is the most sticky. You have these increased procoagulant factors. You have reduced levels of protein S. The fibrinolysis is reduced. You've got protein C resistance. So the blood is the stickiest, if you will, in pregnancy that it ever can be. So you cannot equate managing a patient through non-cardiac surgery with a mechanical valve versus when they're pregnant, because this is the dreaded complication, is clotting off your valve. And mitral valves are probably more vulnerable to clot than the aortic valve. So let's take another case. This is another real case that gives me white hair sprouting out. Um, a 31-year-old cardiac nurse, I don't know if there's any surgeons here, but she worked um, in the OR, and this was the surgeon's favorite, favorite scrub nurse, and I think they're very protective of their favorite scrub nurses. And she had a St. Jude mechanical valve for rheumatic mitral stenosis, wanted a baby and sought advice, and had the exam, everything was good. The echo showed the gradient was five, and her warfarin dose is three milligrams a day. So the question is, if she comes to you, if she wants a pregnancy, which anticoagulant treatment is safest for the mother? Should she go on weight-adjusted, low molecular weight heparin in the first trimester with the concerns about embryopathy? Then when the baby's formed in the second trimester, switch to Coumadin, and we all have to give unfractionated heparin around delivery. Babies can't be delivered when the mother's on warfarin. Baby is also anticoagulated. If they have a vaginal delivery, baby will bleed. So do we do low molecular weight heparin in the first trimester, then Coumadin, and unfractionated around the time of delivery? Do we do low molecular weight heparin throughout? Do we do Coumadin throughout, or do we do unfractionated heparin in the first trimester? And then when we're not worried about embryopathy, switch to Coumadin and heparin peri-delivery. So let's have some votes. Who votes for weight-adjusted low molecular weight heparin in the first trimester? Any hands up? Nobody. Low molecular weight heparin throughout? One person. Coumadin throughout? most people, and then unfractionated heparin. Okay, just one. All right, so most people say Coumadin throughout, and that's probably because you've all been reading the guidelines. And this is what happened to this patient. This is, she's in a university center. I won't say which one. And so she asked the cardiologist um, advice about anticoagulation and was told, don't worry, in the first trimester, we'll just change it to heparin. And so she was given Lovenox 75 BID at six weeks of pregnancy as soon as it was diagnosed. As soon as she was late for her period, switched to Lovenox. And she said, well, I've been reading about this. Should, should my anticoagulation be monitored? And the response was, no, that's not necessary. At 11 weeks, she's short of breath 
And she says, can I have an echo? I'm not feeling quite right. And the response is, well, I'm not sure you need it. I think it's just your pregnancy, but we'll do one anyway. And now the gradient is 14. Three days later, she's in the operating room with her surgeon. She drops the scalpel and she has a stroke. And I get called by the surgeon, not by the cardiologist. And I ask some questions. Has she had a TEE? No. Lots of things hadn't happened, so the bottom line was she was sent by the surgeon. And here's the echo. So where's the echo readers? Where are the fellows? What do we think of this valve? Yes, the leaflets aren't moving normally, are they? And there's something, there's some awful looking thing on one of those leaflets. And when we do the 3D, I think you can see that there is almost certainly something there that's a thrombus and that leaflet's not working well. And of course now the valve that was good has a significant gradient and now she's had a stroke. Catastrophic. Don't worry, we'll just change you to heparin. And so in this situation with concerns about stroke, the same thing, we replaced her valve uh, and put in the porcine valve, 46 minutes bypass, and that was what came off the valve. You can see there's a lot of thrombus attached to it. So um, we got her through. She had a successful pregnancy, delivered at 38 weeks, and actually has had another pregnancy subsequently with her porcine valve. So my Christmas cards have nice pictures of her and babies. But so let's look at this issue. Warfarin is the better anticoagulant. That's the first thing to say, which is why the guidelines recommend it. But of course, as you all know, it crosses the placenta in the first trimester, and we're concerned about embryopathy. But there are other issues with warfarin, including bleeding in the head for the baby and bleeding in the placenta. Heparin is a poor anticoagulant, and any time you use it, it more than doubles the risk of valve thrombosis. So it's good for baby, it doesn't cross the placenta, but it doubles more than the risk of valve thrombosis. Warfarin we know is involved in bone and cartilage development and the neuronal tissues. So we, yes, we worry about the embryopathy, but we've learned that the risk is dose dependent. And if mother's dose is five milligrams a day or less, the risk of having an embryopathy is not zero, but it's low, probably somewhere about 3%, 4%. So what do we do? Do we do warfarin throughout? Do we do heparin in the first trimester? Some women will say, I don't care if you tell me the risk is 1%, I am not taking the risk of my baby having an embryopathy. Give me heparin for the first trimester and then I'll go to the warfarin. Um, and usually we have these three strategies. But again, what we need to tell the patient, we need to give them some statistics. So both the European guidelines and our ACC guidelines that Dr. Nishimura chaired have said the following. Number one, if mother's on five milligrams or less of Coumadin in the first trimester, class 2A, continue. It's safest for the mother. If she's on a bigger dose, more than five milligrams, you have a choice of heparin. And I'll talk about that because they have asterisks there and that's a class 2A recommendation. When baby's formed, no chance of embryopathy, the recommendation is back to Coumadin. And then um, for the third trimester, as I mentioned, unfractionated around the time of delivery and resume shortly after. But let's look at these asterisks, what the guidelines say about the heparin management. So if you elect to stop the vitamin K antagonists and use heparin, if you use unfractionated, not many people do now, you monitor very carefully. You keep the APTT at least twice control. But if you use low molecular weight, which is what most people do, you have to monitor anti-10A and you have to do that about every week and you have to keep it in this window between 0.8 and 1.2. So if the mother's dose of warfarin is greater than five, that's your option is to change to low molecular weight heparin or if the woman says, I don't want warfarin. 
It sounds easy. So you just monitor the anti 10A and everything is great, right? But you never use, and that was part of my question, it was a trick, you never use weight-based. That's the problem. You always monitor anti 10A levels. So it sounds straightforward, it certainly isn't. And let's look at some data, because trying to get to that sweet spot of no clotting, no bleeding, perfect anticoagulation is a challenge. And if you look at much data, the risk of stroke or clotting off the valve is about 17% in many published studies, and I'll show you some recent data. So this is a recent um, meta-analysis that was published from Karen Stout's group uh, on the West Coast in Seattle. A meta-analysis of 800 pregnancies, and this excludes fixed-dose heparin. So these were ones that were monitored with anti-10A. And here we're looking at maternal outcomes. So when you're counseling these patients, what's the risk of mum not having a complication? And here's the data. So vitamin K antagonists, 5%. This is death, valve failure, or thromboembolism. Low molecular weight heparin, look at this, 15%. Doing the combination, 16. Unfractionated the combination, 16%. So anytime you're using low molecular weight heparin, that woman has a major risk, 15, 16% of having some catastrophic complication. Yes, it had the lowest risk of adverse maternal outcomes. Let's look at fetal outcomes. Look at vitamin K antagonists. This is spontaneous abortion, fetal death, or congenital defects. 39% with vitamin K antagonists. You can see low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated is really bad. This is the combination here, 14, 16%. There are problems with the placenta and spontaneous abortion with any anticoagulant strategy. Low-dose vitamin K is not so bad, but still fetal issues of about 15%. So when we're telling these women about embarking on a pregnancy, we need to know these statistics. And they combined composite outcomes. So now we're looking at the risk of a problem with mother and a problem with the baby. And they have this nice little table in their chart there and here you can see vitamin K antagonists, a risk of a maternal or fetal event, 44%, almost half, having a problem. Low-dose warfarin, that's better, but still 20%. Heparin, higher, whenever you use it, about 30%, and unfractionated is even worse, about 50%. And this is the complications that I told you. It doesn't include hemorrhage, peripartum hemorrhage, premature delivery, fetal intracranial hemorrhage, or neonatal death. It doesn't include those outcomes in this composite data. So it sounds very easy. Continue the low-dose Coumadin, switch to low molecular weight heparin. This is the latest meta-analysis. And there's a European registry that has some good data also looking at patients with mechanical valves versus tissue valves. You see the maternal mortality, you see the risk of valve thrombosis and the mortality that's associated with it. And half of these women who had a thrombus on the valve had it in the first trimester when they were changed to heparin. Again, underscoring how inadequate and anticoagulant it is. And then hemorrhage also occurred in almost a quarter of these women. So I think these are salutary lessons. And again, as you do this concern, look at the fetal mortality with anticoagulation. Look at um, miscarriage rate in the yellow bars here using vitamin K antagonists. The miscarriage rate is up to 30%. So it's not just an embryopathy, there is, if you will, a fetopathy that's also associated with warfarin, using it throughout the whole pregnancy, placental bleeding, bleeding in the head, and so on. The vitamin K has a price to pay. So higher rate of fetal loss versus higher risk of thrombosis, 
This is what we have to tell these patients. And in that study, 58% of pregnancies only had a risk of serious, were free of serious adverse events. So it's almost half of them. And lastly, with this data, 58 women, this is a study from England. They do a surveillance system of their patients. How well are we doing treating these patients? Look at this, 49% only of women with a mechanical valve had had pre-pregnancy counseling with free healthcare. 23% hadn't seen a cardiologist in the prior year. What happened to them with their strategies? Same thing, heparin in the first trimester or heparin throughout. 20% good maternal and fetal outcomes. 56% good maternal and fetal outcomes. And whichever of these strategies you use, there is maternal death, anytime you use heparin, maternal morbidity, and only 28% in this series had a good maternal and fetal outcome. So it sounds fairly easy when you read these guidelines, but if you're counseling these patients, this is why I think all of the practitioners need to know when you're embarking on this journey together, this is what we have to face. So I'll summarize, stenotic lesions not well tolerated, Pregnancy counseling, if you can get it, is absolutely essential. Beware the bicuspid valve. Exercise your patients before they get pregnant. And remember, image the entire aorta. Mitral stenosis, the beta blockers. And for these mechanical valves, a real challenge. And at best, 58% of pregnancies free of adverse events. I think they need to be managed in special centers. I'll finish with this slide that I think is a couple, if you imagine the woman with heart disease looking at the horizon and thinking about having a baby, and then you look again, perhaps you can see a fetus here in the picture with the little legs and the baby. And again, for most women with heart disease, they can have a pregnancy with proper care, but as I've shared with you, um, they really need pre-pregnancy counseling first and they need all our help to secure a successful outcome for mother and baby. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay, stay here. Thank you very much, Carol. Amazing presentation on a topic that we usually don't discuss often and uh, it is prevalent. Questions from the audience? you uh, discussed with a patient with aortic stenosis who presented to you at 22nd weeks, would your management have changed if she presented at the, in the third trimester or the first trimester? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we try and avoid surgery in the first trimester if we possibly can because that's the time of greatest fetal loss. Third trimester, if you've got a baby that's well developed and the lungs are mature, we give the steroids to help mature the lungs and do an early delivery. Again, it's that balance, as you know, trying to get the mother as far along in the pregnancy, get the baby as mature as possible. But um, we would do an early delivery, preferably as long as baby was mature. Now, there are some situations when you may need to do both. You may need to deliver the baby and go on bypass, depending on how critical the mother's situation is. Um, and sometimes you're also forced to do surgery in the first trimester. We have done balloons, um, and as you know, there have been a few series that have been published, and if the valve is pliable, um, you can sometimes, if you have your best balloonatic, just tweak it a little bit with obstetric standby so that it's enough to get the baby through to a, a good age and then a, a good delivery. So you've got a variety of choices depending on fetal maturity and how critical the, the mother's ages, but third trimester generally in early delivery is what we would Along do. Along these lines, and, and we have some expert balloonists here, in that population, how long does it last? How long does the effect yeah, last? That's, so you, that's you have a to great kind of question. Yes, so um, actually it doesn't last very long in general. Sometimes we've done it because um, a woman will say, I want a pregnancy and can we delay having a valve replacement? And in general, in my experience, it lasts, if you have a 22, 24, 25 year old woman, it'll last about a year to a year and a half. So if she's not pregnant in that interim, then you're still looking at a valve replacement. Would you consider a tavern? 
Um, in pregnancy or? In that um, uh, That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I don't know nowadays with all the new data, it's lower and lower, lower risk. I think it's been done now, actually. I know of two cases that have been done. I think it's something to be considered. She was before the sort of low risk data came into play. I think it's something that we could consider for the future. Um, we've just had such um, good success with our surgery in the last decade or 15 years. Um, that you know, we we sort of trust our fastest surgeons, and but I think that's something that has to be considered for sure. Rick, any thoughts? We we can tap on you. Well, it's, 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 the problem is yeah. the bicuspid it's the yeah. bicuspid valves. Yeah. So your chances of aortic regurgitation are much more. But I don't know. I think in the next few years we'll have the data on bicuspid valves, yeah. and you're right. It, this would be a, a very something very good to intervention. Consider. Yeah. So really fantastic talk, a lot of really great teaching points. Um, so I guess the question is, as we start to move into systems of care and teams, um, I wonder, have you had any experience in trying to develop a system of care for these types of patients? Obviously because early, um, early care is better than late care. Yeah, I, I think that's really important moving forward, just like with stroke and some of the other systems that we have developed a sort of spoken wheel um, system where there's not just a referral to a tertiary or a quaternary cen center, but also feedback the other way. Let's, let's sort of share the care, let's teach you. Um, I really think for high-risk pregnancy care, the time is, is ripe to develop those systems because it's worked in other centers with trauma and stroke and so on and so forth. I think we need it for high-risk pregnancy care. So there's one phone call to one center, you get everything set up. Um, but teaching back, um, I haven't had any experience with it yet, but I think that's where we need to go. Oh. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, it was clear from your presentation that having a mechanical valve is a precarious situation. But also looking at that slide from Europe, it seemed as if a bioprosthesis wasn't without its own set of issues either. Do you do anything differently in patients who have bioprosthetic? Uh, yeah, of course, some of them will have arrhythmias and be on anticoagulants anyway, but in general, it's a much more benign course. There used to be the concern that pregnancy accelerated valve degeneration. Recent data would suggest that's not the case. It's simply because they're young women and the valves degenerate faster as they're younger. We do put them on baby aspirin, uh, and that doesn't seem to affect the baby uh, and doesn't have any impact on bleeding, but in general, obviously, a much more benign prognosis. But the price to pay, obviously, another surgery. Wonderful presentation. Thank Thanks. you. And I think the, um, the early uh, detection really is so critical. And, and as more women are getting pregnant at an older age and choosing to choose other methods for fertilization, mm. Are there guidelines um, in the OB or, or um, prenatal world as to screening with an echo in, in women above a certain age with risk factors? We, what we are no, seeing no. is women who are presenting with uh, uh, cardiomyopathy undetected while yes. they're going through IVF. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, I mean, um, uh, not that I'm aware of. And uh, as I mentioned the other day, I mean, just this week we had a patient four hours after delivery was tachycardic, short of breath, and was shipped to us, Eisenmenger syndrome. Um, had a thrill, diastolic thrill, putting a hand on her chest. Nobody had put even a hand on her chest, never mind a stethoscope to make the diagnosis. The chest x-ray shows a five centimeter pulmonary artery, no screening at all, immigrated to this country seven years ago. Um, so I'm not aware of any, any guidelines, but you're absolutely right. Women in their 40s particularly now want to have babies. And I don't think there's any sort of routine guideline for any kind of screening. I mean, I think maybe time is right for that conversation to Absolutely. initiate. We just had a 40-year-old uh, with prior history of chemotherapy, EPF yeah. 20%, pregnant with twins after one or two years of IVF. Oh, God. So Heartbreaking, <laughs> yes. Pre-pregnancy counseling is essential, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Any other questions? 
If none, we want to thank you for oh, an amazing thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.